Good morning, Harmony. It is so good to see you. A special welcome to our guest, and thank you for being with us. Thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning. We are excited that you're here, and we're all excited to worship together this morning. So why don't y'all stand with us? You know, we're here to celebrate what a great God we have, and God has done some great things. And the great thing about God is that He has done great things. He is doing great things, and He will continue to do great things in our lives. The idea is that we have to stay close to Him, have to be aware of Him, we have to think on the things of Christ. And so this morning, let's celebrate that He can. Oh 
see how great, how great is our God. Sing that again. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great. seated. Hey, we are glad that you are here today and that you're letting us uh, gather with you uh, and share a little bit of our life with you and, and you can share some of your life with us. Well, today is a special day. Uh, we're going to be honoring some graduates here uh, in just uh, a couple of minutes, but I just want to say real quick, thank you for gathering with us. Uh, to those that are online, those that are in person, uh, we are thrilled that you're here with us today. If you are a guest today, uh, we're very thankful that you're here with us, and we would love for you to stop at the Connection Center on your way out today. We have a gift that we would love to send home with you, uh, and it's just a way of saying thank you uh, for coming and gathering with us and uh, being a part of our service today. How many of you are glad that summer seems like it's finally here, that the sun is out, it's warming up, and the, the rain did not like happen every day uh, last week? Uh, we're, we're thankful uh, for that. Some of you are going, I'm still not sure. Uh, I, I like the gray skies and the cloudy weather and rain every now and then, but, but you will come out of that, and uh, you will will get to where you like that uh, sunshine and the good days uh, that we uh, are, are having. A um, couple of real quick things that I, I want to remind you of. Uh, moms and dads, uh, if you have a, a child, remember that VBS One Day is next week. And AJ is going to tell us uh, about that a little bit more in just a moment. Uh, but next Sunday, VBS One Day, an incredible day uh, to come be a part of what's taking place uh, in our kids' men area. Then on Tuesday of this week, Tuesday, June the 7th, uh, we have Refuel One Day. All of you are invited to attend and be a part of that. We would appreciate if you would register online. It just helps us know uh, how many lunches to plan for. Uh, but it's going to be an incredible day, and uh, we're thankful for what God is doing and bringing together. Uh, so far, we have 35 churches from our state and area that are represented uh, in that. Now, obviously, uh, those that are coming from a couple hours away can't bring a, a big group with them. Uh, they're bringing their staff, or maybe it's a, a bivocational pastor that's taking the day off, uh, and, and he's coming. Uh, but we are thankful for that because we're going to get an impact. Uh, by this time next Sunday, uh, the ministry here at Harmony uh, will have been able to facilitate a setting and situation where we've impacted 35 local churches who have pastors and, and members just like we do that need to be strengthened and encouraged, and it's an awesome thing, and I want to thank you uh, for helping make this happen. So if you would like to come be a part of it, we want to encourage you uh, to do that. Uh, registration opens at 9 o'clock on Tuesday morning. You'll be able to pick up things, uh, and then worship starts at 9.30, and it's going to be an incredible day uh, as we have some main session speakers, and then we have uh, some breakout sessions as well. Katie Wolf is leading a breakout for the ladies, uh, and uh, I suppose anybody that wants to, to go would, would be welcome in that, but it's your real life is your real witness, uh, and that's extremely important. And then Jean Crane uh, with Care to Change is going to be leading a breakout uh, for us as well on what the, the church can do when people experience trauma. Uh, and uh, that's just, uh, you know, in any community uh, that you look at right now, trauma is being experienced. And uh, one of the greatest things that the church can do is to be present in those moments. So if you'd like to be a part of that, you're more than welcome uh, to do that. And then there are other breakouts uh, that are taking place uh, as well. A gentleman by the name of Dave Gibson, one of our main session speakers, is going to be leading a, a, a breakout. And then Matt Wilmington, and uh, the uh, staff pastor uh, at uh, Thomas Road Baptist Church will be one of the main speakers and leading a breakout as well. And, and he'll do a phenomenal job on leadership and leading teams in that breakout. So if you're a leader at work and you want to learn a little bit more, I promise you it's all transferable and will make a difference in all that you do. Well, at this time, I want to 
welcome A.J. Runkles, our student ministry next-gen pastor, and uh, we're going to honor some graduates. Yep, before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about the VBS one day, just so you have that in your head. Uh, next week, that is for kids 5 through 12 years old. We do ask for you to register just so that we have an idea for lunch and for dinner that night, um, but that is this coming Sunday. There will be normal nursery and kids all the way up through uh, uh, service for during the morning service, but then we'll break off for the VBS one day. There's a 40-foot climbing tower with no safety harnesses. I'm kidding. Um, there is a uh, we'll have indoor laser tag. We've got a local artist that's teaching a painting class. Jeff Lar is doing that over in the Founders Chapel. So we got all that stuff that's going on. And then at 5 o'clock, we take a break here and reconvene at Danville Aquatic Center, not the new Murphy one, Danville Aquatic Center at Ellis Park. And we're there from 6 to 8. We've rented out the water park, and that is for the entire church family. All right, so that's for all of you to come. We'll have a food truck there. Uh, the icy truck is there. Our Kona ice truck is there as well. So that's for everybody that evening from 6 to 8. So feel free to uh, come along with that as well. And for parents, today is not just graduation Sunday, as we're going to get to in a second. It's move up Sunday. So if you have a sixth grader, they are now moving up today into youth group. And in their classes, in the small groups over in Kids Men, uh, if they're moving up a grade that's different, so the ways that ours are broken down are four years old through kindergarten, first and second, third and fourth, fifth and sixth. So if they're moving up, they're in a different small group starting this morning. So just in case you, uh, they come back and talk about their new teacher, it's because they just moved up today. So speaking of moving up in the world, let's get our graduates up here, huh? So high school and college graduates, why don't you come on up if you're a high school or college graduate. Come on up if you will. <laughs> Come, on. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Come on. All right. So we've got a couple of, we got two high school graduates and then we've got two college graduates. All right. So we got Ethan's over here. He, he graduated here high school. So you look bigger, You've got Brooke. You? Let me get out of the way. You've got Brooke who's just graduated high school. Luke, why don't you, Luke, why don't you come stand over here? <laughs> That's your better side, but come stand over here. So then you, you've got Josh, who is our new worship pastor. Wanna, he just graduated, as you he know. You've heard a lot about right Josh. Like Josh just graduated from Liberty. And then you've got Luke, who just graduated as well. So as we honor them here in just a second, I'm going to ask Pastor John, as we uh, close the announcement time, to pray over them as they start their new endeavor in life. Uh, one of them we know where he's starting, right? But for the rest of them, as they move on to different colleges... Um, yeah. And then at God Wabash and then at jobs. Cedarville <laughs> and then for Luke as he moves on in his career that uh, God would bless them and be with them. But uh, Pastor John, I know you will. But what I want as we look at these graduates, for me as a next gen leader, I know for Nate as he's worked with Luke uh, in the college group, what we see is not just the effort and the energy that they've put into their graduation. What we see is changing the world right in front of you, that these students and these graduates can change the world just with one life that says, no matter what I do, I am going to teach and preach Jesus. And so no matter what their career may be, what we're interested in as they're sent out from our church is that they are disciple makers, that they go out and change the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If they invent new stuff, if they invent life-changing things, that's awesome. But the real life change comes through Jesus Christ, and that's what we want them to do. So Luke, if you would present to Nate, we've got a card for each of the graduates. Just a little thank you uh, for being part of our group. Uh, Nate has done a lot with, not just Luke, I mean, you gotta give it to Josh and everybody else too. Good, I, I You can tell which one is Nate's favorite, right? <laughs> so let's give them a round of applause, the and then Pastor John is gonna pray over them. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we come to you today and we thank you for these graduates. Lord, I know that there are others that, that couldn't be here today. Lord, they've completed a section of life. They've been able to start something and to see it through, and we thank you for that. Lord, as they move out into different areas of life now, as they begin to live a, a life where they uh, further their education or they begin to, to look for the job that you want them to have or they're stepping into that role that you've already made available uh, for them. Father, I pray that you'll use them in a great and mighty way and I pray that you will help them to know 
that they truly can change the world that they live in and that their life does matter and that they can make a difference for you. And Father, I pray that you'll remind them each and every day that your promises are still true, that you are faithful, and no matter what comes their way, you are with them and you are guiding them. So Father, whether they're pursuing life on the football field, in the classroom, or whether they're going out and they're in the workplace serving you. Father, I pray that you use them in a great and mighty way to make a difference for your kingdom. And we give you all the praise and glory for what you're going to do in them and through them. In Christ's name, amen. You all may be seated. Josh? You join us. Join us as we continue to worship through song this morning. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies.
amazing thing is that God has never caught off guard. And Colossians 3 reminds us that we should not think on the things of this world, but think on the things of God. His truth. He is truth. He is strength. He is faith. And that, are, that is the thing that we want to focus on this morning as we continue to worship. So that we are building our lives around truth. song we could ever sing. You're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. And you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. So we live for you. Lift it up to him this morning as we sing. Jesus, the name that it's a privilege and an honor to have those speakers come and and be able to spend a whole day with us lord i want to be a better witness for you i want to share you more i want to 
spread your hope and, and be your light to more people around me, Lord. We are absolutely in the end times. Your coming is so close. And I know people that don't know you. And I want, I want them to go to heaven and spend eternity with you. And God, I ask that you would just help me to be better and to serve you more and to love you more. Thank you for just being who you are and loving us like we are. Take away all distractions and just help us to completely open up to hear your word today. continue our series on Revelation. When we think about Revelation, we, we think about the future, but many people think about a, a bad future rather than the future that says the best is yet to be. And as we've been looking at the book of Revelation and walking through it, uh, here's what we've discovered, that even when it seems like life is completely out of control and life is falling apart, that, that God is still in charge and God is completely in control. And as we look at the book of Revelation, when we started off, we said that one of the things that Revelation gives us is a picture of who Jesus really is. It's easy for us to, to get caught up in the hype. It's easy for us to get caught up in uh, all of the, the calamities and the chaos that uh, seem to be unfolding. Uh, but when we take a look at the book of Revelation, we discover that it gives us a picture of Jesus in all of his glory, in all of his power, one that is the sacrificial lamb, but one that is the sovereign savior uh, that who's coming to rule and reign forever one day. Well, on a day like today, we, we look and, and we see the future. We see the future with graduates. Today is Pentecost Sunday, which is the, the 50th day after Easter, where when, when the, the Spirit descended upon the, the early church, the, the gathering, that the Holy Spirit came in and dwelt those uh, believers, and, and God just began to do incredible things. And, and when we look at the, the graduates that are going out today, we look at it being on a Pentecost Sunday, where the, the Holy Spirit was sent down to begin to do His work, and we look at all of the things going on around us in our culture, we're reminded that there's a lot of work for us to do. And we would look and say, how could we hope to, to do it? How could we hope to complete it? And, and the reality is this, we can only do it with his help. And when we begin to look at Revelation chapter 7, we're going to see the concept that there's a great future with a, a great multitude in the midst of of the great tribulation. When we think about the great tribulation, we think about judgment. We think about pain and chaos. We, we think about sickness and death. We think about uh, literally uh, large portions of the earth being destroyed in, in single-handed sweeps, right? Uh, ju just all at once, death and decay and destruction beginning uh, to, to unfold. Yet in Revelation chapter 7, in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of all the uncertainty, in the midst of, of what we could call calamity, we see something incredible taking place, and it's called the great multitude. And when we look at Revelation chapter 7, we're going to take a look at verse number 9 and read down through there, and then we're going to come back and just begin to walk through it. It says this, and after these things I looked, 
And behold, a great multitude which no one could number. I want you to remember that. A great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures fell on their face before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. And they shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You know, it's a pretty incredible uh, passage of Scripture when we begin to, to read down through there. John is, is getting a, a vision of, of what heaven is like. He's getting a vision of what Jesus is like. He's getting a vision of, of what the great tribulation and all the pain and, and the heartache is, life, uh, is, is like. But even in the midst of that pain and heartache and even in the midst of seeing Jesus as he is and, and the judgment that has happened and the judgment that, that will come and all the things that are unfolding, John gets a uh, a picture of a great multitude that's called out during this time of trouble and during this time of, of chaos, it's important that we remember that even in the midst of the great tribulation, God is still going to be at work and God is going to be bringing people to him. Now, some people would say, well, if God's still going to be at work and God's still going to be bringing people to him, then why do I need to make a decision for him today? I want to go ahead and live my today and my tomorrow like I want, and I will just wait. Well, I'm going to talk about that in just a few moments, because some of us have a tendency to put some things off, and undoubtedly, in a group this size, those that are watching online, those that will listen later, that there, there's, there's somebody that knows they need to make a decision for Christ. They need to live their life in a different way, whether it's to, to trust him as Savior or whether it's to make some adjustments and begin to put your life in line with his word or, or whether it's to, to begin to look and say, look, the future doesn't belong to me, Lord. It belongs to you. I want to put my life in your hands and I want to go the direction that you want me to go and I want to be what you want me to to be. It, when we look at, at what we're talking about today, it, it brings all of that into a, alignment and, and, and brings it to a place where we really need to think about the decisions that we're making today because they will impact our tomorrow. And, and some of us will say, I'll get to it tomorrow. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The book of Revelation tells us that we don't need to wait until tomorrow. One of the first things that I want to show you in Revelation 7, I just want to talk through uh, that, that we see that's, that's really important, is, is in, in the midst of all of the greatness, we see God's great promises, or we could call it the great promises of God. Let, let's just back up and, and look at some verses in Revelation chapter 7 and verse number 1. It, it says this, and after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. And then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on earth their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. 
Verse number five, it says, and of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. And Naphtali, and Manasseh, and Simeon, and Levi, and Issachar, and Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. You work your way down through there. 12,000 were sealed in all of them, and we have 144,000. We look at a passage like this, and you say, John, you, you mentioned the great promises of God, and what do they have to do with me today? You know, scholars tell us that there's literally thousands of promises contained in these 66 books. And here's the amazing thing, is they were made at different points in time, throughout the, the life of mankind, recorded in God's word, and we look back and every one of those promises that God has made has been fulfilled or is in the process of being fulfilled or will be fulfilled. And we take a look and here's what we see. In Jeremiah chapter 49, verse number 36, here's, here's what Jeremiah says. And, and by the way, Jeremiah's a, a, a a couple of days before John, right? A couple of days, a couple of thousand years, right? That, that, that's what, what we look at. Here's, here's what he says. Against Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them towards all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcast of Elam will not go. Daniel chapter seven, verse number two, a, a, a passage in the Old Testament saying this, Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Four winds, Four corners or four quarters, the four winds of heaven stir, stirring up Daniel 7 2. Again, long before Revelation, Zechariah 6, verse number 5, it says this And the angel answered and said to me, These are the four spirits of heaven who go out from their situation before the Lord of all the earth. We, we look at it and, it and it lines up. Jesus' words, Matthew chapter 24, verse number 31, it says this And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. You notice over and over and over there's the concept of four. Four is, is generally representative of an earthly number and something is getting ready to take place on the earth. But we look and we see in all of those passages of scripture that there's going to be a gathering that God is in control of and there's going to be this movement and this motion that, that begins to take place and here's what we're going to discover. That God is going to begin to do an absolutely incredible work in the midst of great problems. Now, can I tell you something today? God's promises are true. Here's what God has said. He has said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Some of you are, are wondering right now, how can I trust God with the storms that I am going through? And Revelation 7 says this, there's going to be a great storm, and in the midst of that great tribulation, God is going to still be at work, and God is going to still be keeping his promises. Revelation 7 unfolds after the rapture has already taken place. The church, those that know Jesus Christ, have been raptured out, and God is still going to find a way to bring people to him. He's still going to find a way to bring some peace and comfort to those who are hurting, to those who are looking for a, a way of escape. There's going to be that opportunity. Now, we, we think about it, and, and we look at it, and we say, wow. If God's promises are going to be kept and we see in the great tribulation, what, what's keeping me right now from holding on to the promises of God, because the, the same God made those promises. The same God said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. The same God said, you can cast all your care upon me. Why? Because I care for you. The same God said, look, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see, when we begin to look at those statements they flow from the heart of God. They flow from the mouth of God. They flow from the character of God. And we can trust God to keep those great promises. For just a moment, let me ask you this. What, what, what's, what's keeping you from 
trusting the, the promise of God that he'll care for you, that he'll walk with you, that he'll be there with you. When we look at Revelation 7, a time of, of great chaos in the middle of the great tribulation, we see the great promise of God that he's still at work and he's still in control. When death is running rampant, when people are looking to hide in caves and mountains, in Revelation 6, it says the rich, the poor, the kings, the servants, the slaves, the leaders, those that have nobody to, to lead, they are looking for a way of escape, to escape the judgment, to escape standing before the Lamb. And then in Revelation 7, in the midst of all of that, it says God is still in control and God is still fulfilling his word. I want to tell you something. You can trust him today with whatever is taking place in your life. There's another aspect of God's great promises that we need to, to look at. And when we take a look at what's unfolding in Revelation 7, I, I want us to, to see not just God's great promises or the great promises of God, but I want you to see the great witnesses for God. In Revelation chapter 7, I just read it. It says, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. The, the witnesses. It says there's 144,000 witnesses, evangelists, servants that are going to go forth. And, and the Bible says that they are sealed. What are the, the great witnesses of God going to do? Well, well the, the, the Bible says that they're sealed which means that they've got this seal on, on their, their forehead. And it, it's a demonstration that they belong to God. It's a demonstration that God is, is protecting them. It's a demonstration of, of their preservation. So they belong to God. They're going to be protected by God. And, and no one can do anything to them until God is done with them, until they have fulfilled the purpose of God. But what are these people doing? These 144,000 witnesses. Who are they? I, I, I'm amazed. People will say, who do you think they are? 12,000 of the tribe of Judah. 12,000 of the tribe of Reuben. You read down through there, that's who I think they are, right? right? Just exactly what, what, what Scripture says. And God says, I'm, I'm going to be at work. I'm going to seal them as, as a statement that they belong to me. I'm going to protect them. No one's going to be able to harm them. Why is that so important? Why is that so important? Because you're in the midst of death and chaos and destruction. And God says, you know what? There are people that are still yet to come to me. So I am protecting my witnesses who are, are filled with courage, who are filled with a message of hope and truth, and are going out and telling people that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and they must turn to him. That's what's taking place. So we've got this group of 144,000 witnesses, and they are going, and, and they're telling everyone about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing that there's going to be such a time of chaos and uncertainty that, that in this great tribulation, think about it right now, we can go and we can preach the gospel, we can assemble on a, a Sunday morning and worship Christ, but these 144,000 are going to be out preaching and doing other things in, in, in a way to bring people to Jesus, and they're not going to have church buildings and facilities. The Antichrist has already been unleashed. He's already brought a false peace. War and famine and death and destruction are already unfolding according to Revelation chapter 6. And in the midst of all of this, there's going to be a great multitude who belong to God, who are protected by God, and who God is preserving, meaning no one can harm until God is finished with them. I want to tell you something. If you're a believer, you have something in common with them. 
Number one, you're sealed. The Bible says that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. We don't have a seal on our forehead, but we've got him on the inside. And he has sealed our heart. N- num- number two, n- not only are we his possession, but we are protected by him. God's word says that he is actively involved in protecting your life and my life. And it says that he will preserve us, that no one can harm us until God is ready for us. But in Revelation 7, it tells us that this 144,000 has something that we need today. Right here, right now. They have a source of power and strength that's available to them and it's available to to you and I. And it's the zeal for, for, for God to go out and do something for him. Yet in their day, there's going to be such pain and anguish. There's going to be so, so much hurt and sorrow that it's literally driving them to go and give the message. And other people are going to be looking for a way of escape because there's not going to be the comfort anymore. There's not going to be all the things that we're used to. You're not going to be able to, to buy or sell. It's going to be a, an incredible time of chaos. And people are going to be coming to Christ. Great witnesses for God. You see, when we look at Revelation chapter 14 in the first five verses, here's what the Bible says about him. It says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are our virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among them, being first fruits of God, first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Do you know what that passage says about those 144,000 witnesses? It says that they were totally committed to Christ. Nothing else was occupying their time. Nothing else was occupying their heart. Nothing else was occupying what they were going to do with their talents, their abilities, their life. Completely focused on Christ. I wonder what the church could do if we as believers who are sealed with the Holy Spirit today, who are possessed by God, protected by God, and preserved for his purpose, would begin to have that same type of zeal, would just begin to, to realize that, that time is, is short, that eternity is is real, that, that when we read through the book of Revelation, we're, we're not just reading about chaos and calamity and, and what we could call a great tribulation. We're reading about what people just like you and I will have to live through if they don't know Jesus Christ. And honestly, most of us today, and, and, and we can just be honest and we can, we can talk most of us today would probably say, yeah, I, I, I believe that these things are, are going to happen. Yet, when it comes to sharing our faith with someone, we know how it all is going to end. We know that if right now or any moment soon around that the church was raptured out, that those that we know and love that we work with, that we shop with, that our kids play with, whatever it, it, it might be, that live next to us, that don't know Christ. We know that this is what they would be left to endure. Yet many of us shy back from sharing our faith because we don't want to offend them. And, and, and here's honestly what this means, Okay? Let me just give you a little psychoanalysis of that statement. 
It's not that you're worried about offending them. You're worried about being uncomfortable and how they are now going to view you. That's the reality. I'm not talking about being rude. I'm not talking about being offensive, uh, all right? That, that, be, because you can be offensive in, in any way, and I probably just offended some when, when I said what, what I said, but that's okay, uh, right? Because that's, that's, that, that's the, the reality. We worry about how they're going to receive something, what they're going to think of us, and, and all the while we know how the story ends and what are we doing with it. What, 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 are, we, what are we doing to, to use our life for, for a witness. And, and some of us are, are going to say, look, here's, here's the reality, John. If there's going to be those great witnesses that, that are going to do something in the great tribulation, why don't I just let them do that work then? I'll tell you why. Because it's highly probable that the people you know, love, and care won't be here then to hear about it. That's why. I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says today is the day of salvation. The Bible says that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down. And Jesus said, look, when the Spirit comes down, you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. He said, start where you are. And then we're going to work our way out from there. Do you know what that means? That The moment that we come to Christ and we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, do you know what that means? You and I have a job to begin to do. And that is to be a witness for him. To, to start where we are, not to put it off to, to someday, not to put it off to a, another day, not to put it off to sometime down the road. So, so why wait to be a great witness? What, why wait to, to be a great witness? We, we have chaos and uncertainty and death and destruction unfolding around us continually. Continually unfolding around us. We, we, we've got things that, that, that are happening in our culture, in our society, where, where we, we look and, and we, we, we have an overdose rate that, that, that is climbing and climbing and climbing. And, and the reality of, of that is, is this, many of those things may not even be an overdose. It, it might be somebody that, that was taking something that, that, that didn't know what they were taking. But you know what? They were looking for a way of escape from that moment that they were in. We have other people that, that are out in life and they're filled with anger and, and they're filled with uncertainty. So they, they take and, and they, they commit senseless acts of violence that you and I can't explain. And can I tell you something? No law is, is going to go ahead and stop until we begin to reach the heart of the issue. And the heart of the issue is inside the heart of man. That is where the problem ultimately is. And here's a reality. If you know Jesus you and I have the, the answer to society and culture's greatest problem, and it's sin. And Jesus is the only one that can heal it. He's the only one that can redeem it. And, and it's time for you and I to say, you know what? There's going to be a group in Revelation 7 that are going to be sealed witnesses, but we're already sealed witnesses if we're a believer. So we're going to start sharing our faith with our family and friends. We're going to be committed to being real for Jesus as these people are going to be real in their day. Why wait to be a great witness? Well, we look at another aspect of this, and let's talk about the great multitude coming to God. The great multitude coming to God. There's a, a few things I want you to notice about that multitude. Somebody would say, how many? The Bible says, too many to count. That's a multitude. I think it's kind of interesting. You go throughout Scripture, and numbers are, are played out over and over and over. You read from the Old Testament, and you read up to Revelation, and we have numbers for every type of scenario. Jesus fed the what? 5,000 right? I mean, it was a multitude, but he fed 5,000. On another occasion, fed a, a few more, 
right? We know that on the, the day of, of Pentecost, the Spirit was poured out, church was taking place, and how many were added unto the church? 3,000, right? Another time, 5,000, and then we, we go. But we work our way up to Revelation, and we see it in verse uh, Revelation chapter 7 and the verses that, that flow out of that. It tells us that there's 12,000 witnesses from each tribe. It gives us 144,000. We know how many witnesses there are, but the Bible says the converts are too many to count. An untold number. We read down through. It's a group that's too large to count. It's a group that represents every tribe, nations, and peoples and tongues on the earth. Here's what the the Bible says about the great multitude coming to God. They're a number too large to count. They're a group that represents all nations. They're standing before the throne. What, What does that mean? The throne is a place of judgment. It's a place of reverence, but it's also a place of of worship. They're standing before the throne and they're standing before the Lamb. What does that mean? They're being represented by Jesus. I love that a witness went out and told them about who Jesus is. And now we have this scene in heaven. These people that have come to Christ and in coming to Christ, this multitude loses their life and they're standing before the throne and they're they're there represented by Jesus, which just means this. They didn't get there because the witness was so great. They didn't get there because of their own goodness. They got there the same way we all get there. That's through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we often don't witness because we think we're going to mess it up. And some would not come to Christ because they're busy trying to be good enough. Well, I want to tell you something. We all come to the throne of God, and we stand before him with the lamb, if we know the lamb, if we've trusted him. It's not by our own goodness. It's not by our own merit. It's not whether or not somebody else gave us a good witness. It's did we trust in Jesus, the great multitude that's coming to God. Imagine the largest stadium and gathering that you can think of filled with people, and the Bible says, you know what, it doesn't even come close. They're standing before the throne. They're before the lamb. They're represented by Jesus. They're clothed in white, just meaning they're righteous before God, and it's not their own. They're now clothed in white. There's palm branches that are there. That's what the Bible says in verse number nine. Clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hand. A palm branch is just a sign of victory, a sign of who Jesus is. It says, in crying out with a loud voice, saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There's loud voices declaring who salvation is from. You know what they're doing? They're bragging about God's goodness. They're bragging about the sacrifice of Jesus and who he is and what he's done. There's this multitude that's coming to God. Now, some of you said earlier, or I suggested that some would say, I'll just wait and I'll get to it later. I'll trust God later. Do you know what the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians? In 2 Thessalonians, it it tells us this, that when the rapture takes place and the tribulation begins to unfold, that there's going to be a great delusion that takes place. And those that have already heard an honest hearing of the gospel and had an opportunity to hear and know who Jesus is and have rejected it are going to believe this delusion. Billions of people are going to disappear and somebody's going to have an explanation and people will believe it. Yet somewhere along the line, those that haven't heard the message of hope, the message of redemption of, of Jesus Christ, these witnesses are going to go out and, and they're going to be sealed and they're going to be protected and they're going to be telling all these people who, who haven't heard. And there's going to be a great multitude. So for some that, that say, I'll, I'll just wait, I just want to tell you, here's the reality, you might die before then. 
may not make you feel any better, but it's true. You might die before then. In, in the great tribulation, the Bible says that you're not going to believe. If we're interpreting scripture right, it says that, that you're not going to believe. Now, now's your chance. Another thing is, is this a question. Why, why go through pain and suffering? Why? why? Why go ahead and miss out on missing Jesus today? Well, let's take a look at one last thing, and it's the multitude that's with God. In verse number 15, it says this. It says, therefore, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat, for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes." Let's look at the great multitude with God. The Bible says that there's a great multitude with God, and here's what they're doing. They're serving him. They're just there serving him. The Bible says that they're getting care from him. It says that he's shepherding them. In verse number 17, it means he's giving them care. It's kind of amazing. We'll get to to serve him, and he's still going to be caring and shepherding. It says that he's going to give leadership. It says that he is, is leading them. Well, where is he leading them? He's, he's a guide, according to verse number 17, and he's going to lead us to fountains of living water. He's going to lead us to the things that refresh us, refuel us, and fill us. But then the Bible says that there's compassion. He's going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. I want to ask you something. Why would you risk missing that? Why, why, why risk missing that? A chance to be able to serve Jesus, meaning to do, do things for him to, to honor him. A chance for him to, to be taking care of you, loving on you, caring for you, wiping away those tears, why would we risk missing that? And why would we allow other people to risk missing that by not telling them? You see, when we look at the future in Revelation 7, if we were just to, to look at Revelation 6 and some of the other things that, that unfold after and, and miss out, we, we might forget or just overlook that God is still at work in the midst of difficult times. And we're in the midst of a difficult t- culture. We're in the midst of a difficult season. We're in the midst of difficult times. But, but can I just tell you this? The church is still alive and well, and, and the church is still God's agency in this life. And the church is not a building. The church is you and I. It is believers who are sealed. We are possessed by God. We are protected for, for his purpose, and we are preserved to go and do what he has called us to do. And I believe with all of my heart that you and I have the answer that gives the world hope. And we need to be sharing that answer. And that answer is Jesus. What someone does with Jesus determines their future. Revelation 7 makes it plain. When we accept him, there's going to be that day we're going to be gathered around his throne. And other people are going to be brought in to that gathering from different tribes and nations and tongues. And and God is still going to be at work even in the great tribulation. But don't wait. Don't put it off coming to him. Don't put it off telling others about him because life is tremendously uncertain. And we need to realize that just as those evangelists are sealed with a purpose. You and I, if you're a believer, are sealed with a purpose. And we've got something to do, and that is to go and be that witness for him right where we are with what we have, with what we can do to honor him. Would you pray with me? 
Father, we come to you today and we thank you for who you are. And Lord, as we look at Revelation, I pray that you would help us to not become overwhelmed with all of the uncertainty and the chaos that is seemingly unfolding. Lord, I pray that you would help us to know that we can trust you, to know that we can come to you now, that you have always kept your promises, that you will always keep your promises. And Father, I ask that you'll work in our hearts and in our lives in this place. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to ask you today, are you certain that you know Christ as your Savior? If you're not certain that you know Christ as your Savior, I just want to invite you, the best you know how, to put your faith and trust in him. Jesus came into this world to live a perfect life, and he did. And the reason he did that is because you and I aren't capable of it. We're sinners. Meaning this, we're not perfect. We've done wrong. We've sinned. We've missed God's mark. So Jesus came in. He lived a perfect life. He went to the cross. He was buried, and he died, and he rose again. And because of that, you and I can have new life. We can have salvation in him. And today, if you're not certain that Jesus is your Savior, if you're not certain that you've asked him to forgive you of your sins and to, to be your Savior, then right here, right now, the best you know how, just, just simply offer a prayer from your heart to the heart of God where you just simply say, Jesus, the best I know how, I'm telling you today that I'm a sinner and I'm placing my faith in your death, your burial, and your resurrection to forgive my sins and to be my Savior. If you'll do that, he'll do what he said. And that's this, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Today, if you'd like to do that, I encourage you to do that right, right now. Maybe you're here today and you say, John, I, I've already trusted Christ as my Savior, but honestly, I know some people who, who haven't. I know some people who need to know Christ. And I want to I want to be a witness to help them come to you. If that's you right, right now, just between you and the Lord, make that your prayer. Lord, give me the strength. Give me the courage to be a witness. To be a witness for you, Lord. Whatever your need might be, just join me in prayer as we pray. Father, we come to you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. And Lord, if there's one here today who's trusting you as their Savior, as, as we speak, they're placing their faith in you, Father, we celebrate that and, and we thank you for that. The Bible says that in the throne of heaven, there is rejoicing when someone comes to you and, and acknowledges you as Savior. So Father, we celebrate that today here. Lord, for those that are saying, help me to be that witness Lord, I pray that you'll help us all to be a greater, bolder witness for you. And Father, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for thank gathering you for with us today and being a part, of, and part and allowing of us to share our service. Hope On your way you. out today, you, you know, have the opportunity. When we think about the love of Jesus, it's absolutely amazing to stop and realize that he gave his life for you and for me. And all we have to do is simply put our faith and trust in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And that changes us for all eternity. Today, if you've never invited Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to be your personal savior, I wanna encourage you to do that right now. It's as simple as admitting that your life is not perfect, admitting that you've sinned, that you've missed God's mark of perfection and putting your faith and trust in his son, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is God's love in action and he demonstrated his love for you and for me by going to the cross, by being buried and by rising again on the third day. And today, if you'd like to invite him to forgive you of your sins and to be your savior, I would encourage you right where you are just to simply say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins and to be my savior. And he 
will do it. If you've made that decision today, please let us know. Please reach out to us. We would love the opportunity to help you learn more about who Jesus is and the incredible plan that he has for your life. If you are a part of the Harmony family, uh, you're part of our Harmony uh, online community and our online campus, I want to thank you for joining us as well. And I want to invite you to start regathering with us in person if you would like to do so. But please remember, we're keeping everything online as well, so you're not going to miss out uh, on our Sunday morning experience and the other things that we've been doing through the week. We're going to continue to offer those and to continue to meet a need in your life. And if you would like to help us continue uh, to serve our community and, and literally the world, uh, we would encourage you to hop on over to harmonyofavon.com forward slash give, and you'll be able to help us continue the ministry and to make a difference, not only here locally, but globally as well. Thank you for being a part of Harmony at Home. And I pray uh, for God's greatest blessings in your life. And I hope that you'll continue to stay connected to us throughout the week. You have a great day.